Welcome to the first of our second semester offerings for the Lonergan Workshop Contributions to the Church in the 21st Century Initiative. Uh, before we get going, I want to alert you to the uh, last two talks in the series. On Thursday, two weeks from now, April 28, but in Fulton, the top of the School of Management, uh, William Murnian is going to speak on a postmodern Christian ethics of peace. Uh, postmodern, I think, means that he's not very um, confident that the just war theory makes sense anymore. <laughs> Otherwise, he's pretty not postmodern. <laughs> and then Michael McCarthy is speaking about on, on May 5th, here again in McGuinn, the loss of effective authority, the crisis in tr trust and credibility. Uh, Michael is a student not only of Lonergan, but also of Hannah Arendt, and he has some wonderful ideas, uh, which he's been trying out in different venues, and especially at the Woodstock Institute at Georgetown with people in journalism and politics. And I think he has some very salient things to say about the situation of the church today. Uh, now, I'd like to um, introduce our introducer. I don't usually do this, but it's because of Brian that we have tonight's wonderful speaker. And it's also uh, my pleasure to introduce Brian, because he's done that for me so many times. And to say that Brian is the um, factotum, the head, the organizer, the do everything to make successful of the Perspectives Program here at BC. Uh, he's he's, he's a, just a tremendously friendly, helpful person and a great leader. And because also of his community leadership and contributions and his teaching, he's also the winner this year of the Waldron Prize. So welcome, Brian. <laughs> I'd like to thank Fred and uh, Sue for giving me this opportunity to introduce uh, David Jeffrey. Um, <clears throat> if I understand the protocol for introductions, the usual format is to give a laundry list of articles, books written, and academic honors achieved by the speaker. However, this evening I wish to do something a little different. I wish to introduce David through my own experience of him two years ago when I met him at a conference at Baylor University. Now, this is not to, uh, to deny the fact that David is very accomplished academically and intellectually. But <clears throat> I know David more from what he uh, presented and our conversations at dinner. And it seemed to me that's a better barometer of how I would like to make this introduction. So as I mentioned, I met Dr. Jeffrey two years ago at a conference at Baylor. And he gave the closing uh, remarks for a conference. And as I was listening to this lecture, I found myself spellbound by the breadth of his understanding and knowledge and precision of his intellect. He was always generous, patient, and gracious when fielding questions, even in the face of some which were anything but benign. More importantly, here was a man who reminded me in a very rich and profound way what we Catholics sometimes take for granted, how crucial is the journey of faith seeking understanding. David seemed to me then to be a man for whom commitment to religious faith and the life of the mind was something natural and in many ways obvious. Later that evening, Tom Hibbs, who was in our department before he heard the siren call of West Texas, which I'm still in mourning about, invited me to dinner to join David and another man, David Solomon from Notre Dame, for dinner. It was at this dinner that confirmed to me my original impressions of David. But it did more than just confirm those. It enriched my experience. I found David to be intellectually generous, charming, and possessed with a great strength of character, evidenced by his unfailing commitment to the intellectual life and his faith. I was already beginning to think that this is someone I ought to mention to Fred and Sue for future possibilities. But when he told me that his grandfather had grown up next door to the young Bernard Lonergan, hell, it was a slam dunk. <laughs> Let me end this reading 
or let me end this introduction by reading a passage from David's book, People of the Book, which I think expresses what I thought I've learned about David in our conversations. In Augustine's view, the incentive for so much learning is not then by any means mere mastery of knowledge for its own sake. Such ambition puffs up the mind and makes it an object of idolatrous worship. What promotes earnest and excellent scholarship in the Christian is fear of the Lord. The motivation for a better understanding of scripture is the desire for conformity of the will of the scholar with the will of God. The true reader wants to know principally what is to be done. Dr. David Jeffrey. Well, thank you for those very generous uh, remarks, uh, Dr. Brian Brennan. And uh, I want to thank uh, so many folks who have made this visit uh, possible for me. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Fred Lawrence and his wife Sue, of course, and, uh, and also the Jesuits of St. Mary's who have been wonderful hosts to me. Uh, and uh, have made this visit memorable already. We are also needing to thank some people who aren't here, and I've you know, been invited really to do that by what Brian has said. Uh, we did poach away some very good people from Boston College, and I, I don't want you to feel too awfully bad about that. I, I want you to think of them rather, I'm thinking of Dr. Tom Hibbs from your philosophy department, Dr. Robert Miner from your philosophy department, and one of your graduate students who came to us by way of Notre Dame, Dr. Michael Foley, a theologian. I want you to think of them, them as rather uh, as missionaries to the Baptists. <laughs> uh, and uh, they are amongst the most precious uh, friends and colleagues that I have there. Um, I feel a bit, uh, you know, when coming to speak to you, uh, uh, I feel a bit like I'm bringing coals to Newcastle or as if I were a, uh, maybe a member of the uh, New York Yankees fan club trying to give a pep talk in the locker room for the Bosox or something. And, um, and it's not really, uh, it's not really uh, qualifications that I can bring for this. But I want I to give you one story about Baptists in Texas that will give you a sense of what's different in the environment in which your former colleagues now work um, that, than, than here. Uh, and the story goes like this. There's a cowboy walks into a bar in Texas and he orders three pints of beer. And uh, he sits in the back of the room with these three pints, and he drinks a sip out of each one in turn. And when he finishes them, he comes back to the, bar, to the bar, and he orders another three. And the bartender uh, says to him, well, you know, um, actually, they go a bit flat, the way you're drinking them, and if you let me draw them one at a time, they'll be a bit better. And the cowboy replies, he says, well, you see, I've got two brothers. <clears throat> one of them is in Australia, and the other's in Dublin, and I'm in Texas. And when we all left home, we promised that we drink this way to remember the days that we drank together every Thursday night, so I drank one for each of my brothers and one for myself. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the bartender admits that this is a, an interesting custom, and he leaves it there. And the cowboy becomes a regular at the bar, and every Thursday night he shows up and he drinks the same way. He orders three mugs and drinks them in turn. One day, however, he comes uh, along and he orders two mugs. And all the regulars take notice and they fall silent. And when he comes back to the bar for the second round, the bartender says, oh, I don't want to uh, intrude on your grief here, but um, I wanted to offer my condolences on your loss. <laughs> and the cowboy looks quite puzzled for a moment, and then the light dawns, and he laughs. Oh, he says, everybody's just fine. It's just that my wife and I joined the Baptist church, and uh, I had to quit drinking. <laughs> <laughs> There's a kind of uh, creative anti-realism that dominates Texas, and uh, it's good to have a Catholic perspective on some of these things. Not, not, not that I'm sure you don't have creative anti-realisms of your own. You saw the, um, the title on the, uh, on the poster at the door, and it's got a lot of words in it, and I, I want to reduce your levels of alarm. Um, you know, this did come about because of Brian and his enthusiasm. Uh, for what were just simply opening remarks. And I found myself um, redrafting these things and writing a bit more and writing a bit more and finally got to be this enormous wad of stuff. And uh, so I'm going to concentrate just on the wisdom part of this tonight. I will mention the other words briefly. Uh, and uh, I want to begin, if uh, you will permit me, with some words with which our traditions mutually are deeply familiar from the Hebrew Scriptures from the book of Deuteronomy. Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Akkad. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. 
And these words which I give to you today shall be in your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. And these words ascribed to Moses are, in their stark simplicity, really at the root of all subsequent normative thinking about Christian education. This is true whether we are thinking about subsidiarity and the responsibility of parents, or the highest intellectual aspirations of formal education in the Christian university. These are, in effect, the core principles which once animated the evolution of scholarship and Christian learning in the monastic schools, principles well captured in a book which I read as a very young man by Dom Jean Leclerc, The Love of Learning and the Desire for God. To many of our contemporaries, however, Moses' words seem merely quaint and the Deuteronomic principles problematic. Other words and principles prevail, and in the sway of their dominion, the historic mission of Christian colleges and universities can appear, even to those who love this mission, embarrassingly antiquarian. This embarrassment takes many forms and is sometimes expressed in wobbly justifications for the modification or the compromise, even, of historic mission statements. Tonight, I would like to offer something of a gesture toward a counterpoint. Let us begin with a thought experiment. Suppose it was true that virtue could not be taught, that no firm principles could be deduced from any exemplar, that all learning was irreparably circumstantial, personalistic, autobiographical. Suppose that the hardcore relativism of the literary theorists accurately describe both an ethical and an epistemological limit, that there was therefore no objective truth to be had from texts or for that matter from other people. Suppose that our egocentrism really was so thoroughly prophylactic that likewise nothing of the past, no artifact, no record, calculus or testimony could get to us could be to us much more than a mere curiosity, then in what would an acceptable education consist? Well, if we go by the record of our culture in improved techniques, techniques for the heightening of self-consciousness, for the increase and extension of physical, perhaps sometimes in some environments, especially sexual vigor, the passive mastery of useful mechanical knowledge by sophisticated technical means. You could make your own list. In my university, communication science, computer science, consumer science, these are very interesting titles, aren't they? We, we dignify our preoccupation with technical training by calling it science. But none of these technical efforts, I don't mean to say this, none of these technical efforts are without value. On the other hand, the displacement of theoria by praxis, of the logos in learning by the techne in technology, has been more radical in the past century than at any previous time in the history of higher education. One unfortunate consequence of this has been a corresponding diminishment of concern amongst educationists generally to set as a goal the development of character or virtue. A corresponding development in scholarship has been an almost obsessive preoccupation with liminality and with methodologically theoretical areas of interest. And these preoccupations and others arising from them have sometimes led to false dichotomies in the arena of scholarship and in many spheres to a reduction of what we are pleased to call scholarship to peripheral advocacies for various agendas of an essentially political and sometimes locally political character. In the more extreme cases, this development has entailed an unfortunate marginalization of basic intellectual scholarship to a degree that is unlikely, I think, to be in the best interests of Christian higher education. In so ardently pursuing subjective and limited values at the expense of <coughs> common virtues, individual self-expression at the expense of communal wisdom, private gain at the expense of common profit. I find myself wondering if it's not possible that we have diminished the distinctive goods, most evidently ours, to offer. 
No one seriously doubts that even a Christian university can entirely evade the necessity of technical training and a certain fashionable cachet in the packaging and marketing of its educational products. Too much revenue depends upon it. On the other hand, when even a Christian university finds that money or ideological market fashion have eclipsed the historic rationale for a liberal and moral education, then serious questions about the institutional identity, justifiability, and even viability of these institutions are likely to arise. In my title, I've identified four educational desiderata, which have been historically central to education in a Christian context. All are elsewhere, at the very least, contestable. In the context of secular higher education, I suppose even to conjoin these four terms, wisdom, freedom, community, truth, in this way, might be seen as belaboring anarchism. Yet for us, and by us I mean those of us who are involved in university projects such as Boston College or Baylor University, I suppose, for us, the conjunction is at the very heart of our special wisdom. And periodically, it is good to remind ourselves that we are, after all, in the wisdom business. <laughs> wisdom. In the Old Testament, uh, wisdom, chokmah, implies an educated discipline of mind, coupled with a skillful, practical discernment. The word for that in Hebrew is bina. They almost always are conjoined. It involves us both theoria and practica, and is never purely one or the other. Wisdom concerns all kinds of possible human knowing, up to but not necessarily including the knowledge of divine revelation. As such, the term sometimes becomes idiomatic uh, for those books of moral instruction in the biblical anthology which taken together have obtained the designation as they do, I think, first in the Renaissance uh, in the Counter-Reformation period with Cornelius a Lapide, the books together become a catalog, they can become a canon, and they're called wisdom literature. Job, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, and so on. Proverbs, for example, presents itself explicitly as a manual of moral instruction. It's offered to the student that that student might seek wisdom in a full life, becoming so intimately familiar with wisdom as to be said to be married to her. The Venerable Bede, greatest of the early Anglo-Saxon biblical commentators, is representative for Christian tradition in the way in which he instaurates this particular text at the heart of Christian moral instruction. The proverbial aphorisms are directed, Bede says, toward five representative goals or pedagogical agendas in biblical wisdom teaching. How to believe rightly, how to live properly, how to perceive others truthfully, how to give sound direction to the intentions of one's own heart, and finally, how to define responsible objectives for teaching others. It is pertinent to our topic that in biblical Hebrew, the seed of wisdom is not the head but the heart. Leb, lebam in Hebrew, thus one applies one's heart to knowledge and to the skills of understanding. To have acquired wisdom is, in Hebrew, to be wise-hearted. Chokmah lib. Solomon was granted his request for wisdom with the divine words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, it says in 1 Kings. In this way, expressions involving the heart signify a range of intellectual processes. To consider carefully or to take seriously is literally, in Hebrew, to lay something to the heart. To pay attention is literally to give the heart. To take something to heart is still a familiar biblicism in English. And in the Psalms, as well as in the New Testament, the heart ponders, it meditates. And it is the locus of considered belief, as well as of considered doubt and disbelief, too. The heart, moreover, remembers, we are told in Scripture. And if you want all these biblical references, I'll Pass them on to Dr. Lawrence. <laughs> it remembers. And when something is forgotten, in Hebrew, it is said literally to have been turned aside from the heart. It's no surprise then that in the Old Testament, it's the heart which acts as the seat of conscience. 
persistently into the New Testament whenever our hearts condemn us, as it says in 1 John 3. Memory, intellect, and discernment of the will are all involved. To learn something by heart, as we say in English, invites and conveys all these aspects of mental discipline together. Now, as we've seen, the Deuteronomic commandment to love God with heart, soul, and strength similarly privileges the heart. It's the first item. And that makes fulsome Hebraic sense. If you're reading this thing in Hebrew, that's exactly the way it ought to go. But it's not so evident that it should go that way in Greek. And so when Jesus reiterates this command, focusing it toward the second commandment to love your neighbor as yourself in Matthew 22, on Matthew's account, he substitutes for the word mind, excuse me, he substitutes for the word strength, the word mind. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and then your neighbor as yourself. One reason might be that the Greek equivalent for heart, cardia, has other more purely emotional connotations for its hearers. Something more is needed to indicate intellectual affection as an, an animus, a drive for moral education leading to social action. In Matthew, Jesus amends his text from strength to mind, therefore, permitting his translation of the great Shema to bear the full weight of Hebrew wisdom as it might be collectively understood. And perhaps more deeply than we have always registered it, the great commandment remains thus a precy of educational objectives in the Christian context. The question I have to ask about this, and forgive this brief theological survey, <laughs> the question I have to ask is, is this possible, I wonder, more than we have realized, that we have turned this first love, the first clause of the great commandment, a bit aside from our hearts as we've gone about our business. It's a consideration in this context that memory itself hasn't been for a very long time fashionable uh, in early education, Christian or otherwise. I've talked to several of the Jesuits uh, today, and they seem to have been afflicted with the same requirement to memorize things that I was. <laughs> but we don't always do this uh, anymore with our, with our students. And uh, those who, by disciplined training of their memories and youth, po possess capacious memory are, are even thought of by some educational theorists these days to have a kind of unfair advantage, uh, as do those who speak several languages. And tacitly, I think we could say that the drive of American higher education in the late 20th century has been in part to make both attainments, the cultivation of a disciplined memory and the discipline of foreign language acquisition, unnecessary, even perhaps undesirable. But these two forms of forgetful neglect, I want to suggest, have been unwise. And that particularly in respect of a Christian education. Each of these neglectful impulses is in fact, of course, antisocial. The one rejects the socius or neighbor of the past. The other rejects the socius or neighbor of the present. We have not loved these neighbors as ourselves. The biological inexactitude of Hebrew heart language in respect to the life of the mind are not at all infelicitous from the perspective of education at least not wherever education has as part of its purpose the nurture of the affections for the sake of building maturity and character. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee, the psalmist sings. The pregnant Virgin Mary, considering the revelation which has been vouchsafed to her, pondered all these things in her heart. The connection between the word taken to heart and the Christian doctrine of the incarnation is, of course, direct and profound in its sacramental as well as in its social implications. I, I suspect I am uh, far from the only one here today who, when still a child, then memorized something. <laughs> memorized maybe even poetry, maybe some catechisms, prayers, and Bible verses, perhaps. The discipline of memorization was typically presented to us as a practice which was propiedutic to the acquisition of wisdom, not merely a store of information. Included in my own childish repertoire, and wisely so I reckon, were these words attributed to Solomon. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But I soon learned that the scriptures in particular abound in such counsel. 
The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, repeats the psalmist, who then adds, and all those who practice that have good understanding. As we've seen, it is this capacity to express knowledge through principle with practical or applied intelligence, which is the real hallmark of biblical education on the scriptural view. Knowledge is wisdom's servant and not the other way around. So then in the commentary of Thomas Aquinas, it is unsurprising to find, and I quote, that a wise man in any branch of knowledge is one who knows the highest cause of that kind of knowledge and is able to judge of all matters by that cause. And a wise man absolutely is one who knows that cause which is absolutely highest, namely God. Hence, the knowledge of eternal things is called wisdom, while the knowledge of human things is called knowledge. The continuity of Christian reflection on this key distinction reinforces the point with persistent application to embodied wisdom or practice of the virtues. But it also applies to scholarship. Much of the research and publication we academics do is necessarily going to have to do with what Aquinas calls in this passage I have quoted, scientia, science, knowledge, the knowledge of things. Much of that scholarship in itself is going to result in little or no theological reflection. Aquinas' teacher, Albert the Great, would have insisted that that is so. But if, as learning communities, we neglect altogether the scholarship of wisdom, or if we fail in our effort to draw the scholarship of scientia toward that sapience, that wisdom which is our particular calling and our distinctive reason for being, then we will have been, a, uh, we will have been I think, disobedient, disobedient to the Deuteronomic commandment. I also want to suggest that if we fail to do that, if we fail to draw scientia toward that sapience, which is our calling, we'll, we will have been, pragmatically speaking, unwise. <clears throat> Four centuries after um, St. Thomas, if you will forgive one Baptist reference in this paper, <laughs> John Bunyan, in his Pilgrim's Progress, has his character named Faith observe as follows. Now there is knowledge and knowledge. Knowledge that rests in the bare speculation of things and knowledge that is accompanied with the grace of faith and love, which puts a man upon doing the will of God from the heart. Now the source of those two compatible statements, the one by Aquinas and the other by Bunyan, is clearly the Bible. Yet there has long been some interplay, even tension, between intellectual apprehension and embodied application whenever there have been Christian discussions of wisdom, especially in the university. I think of the Renaissance philosopher Descartes, who, for example, believed that if you wanted to understand what wisdom was, you would see it as the sum of all the sciences taken together, and that was identical with human wisdom. Indeed, following in the wake of Descartes and Francis Bacon, the identification of human wisdom with the sum of scientific knowledge has become more or less the conventional wisdom of the secular university. It is more typical, however, of Christian formulations to suggest that the intellectual disciplines, each of them, in some manner flow forth from the wisdom of God and make best sense when they are referred to their ultimate cause. Knowledge of that cause is therefore regarded as indispensable to the pursuit of all other knowledge on the Christian view. And all of their knowledge, when rightly referred to him, is an enrichment of that primary knowledge, which the scriptures call wisdom. On this account, wisdom is a sort of plenum, a property of the whole person. Speaking of Christ as the incarnate exemplar, St. Anselm of Canterbury will say, Christ, he is the intelligence of intelligence, the knowledge of knowledge, the wisdom of wisdom, and the truth of truth. By the way, if you're looking for my epigraph, there it is. <laughs> it, it's for this deeper reason, I think, that Augustine expects 
the Christian scholar to speak with more or less wisdom, as he says, to the degree that he has made progress in the knowledge of the scriptures. For Augustine adds, neither do I mean simply by reading them often and committing them to memory, though that is good, but by understanding them aright and carefully searching out their meaning. For Augustine, there is a plenary sense in which all of scripture reveals the mind of God. And it is in this vital fullness that one receives it as the word of God made flesh in the incarnation. Conversely, as Dei Werbum says in the encyclical language, which is often so concise, ignorance of the scriptures is ignorance of Christ. Full stop. Liberal education in the Christian tradition has always implied a conversation which begins with biblical wisdom, the totem integrum of the scriptures as centered upon the person and praxis of Christ as revealed to us in those scriptures in worship and also in the life, the lived life, the embodied life of the church, the body of Christ. In the light of this wisdom, we proceed to explore then everything else in creation, including the works and the words of men and women such as ourselves. This one presumes is what led His Holiness John Paul II to his suggestion concerning how philosophy might regain its place at the heart of the moral curriculum in the Christian university. And you may remember this passage, it's in Fides et Ratio, and he says, to be consonant with the word of God, philosophy needs first of all to recover its sapiential dimension as a search for the ultimate and overarching meaning of life. The great African bishop and teacher of the Universal Church, St. Augustine, was among the early Christian writers who identified uh, this wisdom spoken of in Proverbs, especially the personification of wisdom in Proverbs 8, with the Logos, the word from the beginning, spoken of also in the prologue of John's Gospel. In its amplitude, Augustine's pedagogical, uh, pedagogical conviction was that that one might ap approach this discovery of the meaning of the Logos from without the text, outside the text. You might just sort of reason your way toward it by observation and logic. But that the best way to go about it would be to combine both the scriptures as a resource and what science could teach you and do those things together. Uh, on, on Augustine's view, the flow of insight from scripture to rational inquiry and back again to scripture, gains a kind of increment of insight with each sort of sweep of the widening gyre of that conversation. And thus he says, the wisdom of Christ in turn confers upon the learner a special order of moral discernment too. For unless God's wisdom in Jesus, he says, had condescended to adapt himself to our weakness, we could not after all properly differentiate between the high wisdom of God and the low cunning of such as ourselves. <laughs> Consistently with the Apostle James in his epistle, Augustine encourages his students to anticipate progressive refinements of understanding as part of the benefit that we get from reading scripture together in community. Greater maturity enables one to distinguish between wisdom which comes down from above and that which is after all earthly or unspiritual, even as St. James likes to say devilish. But it is definitively the wisdom incarnate for us in Christ, his example, which shows us the way to approach that which we try to understand things, that, that which we try to understand as, as data in the world. Augustine quotes the Apostle James in his summary of the Sermon on the Mount in such a way as to identify spiritual wisdom directly with a kind of moral virtue, a kind of character maturity. And here's the words from James. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, uh, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality, of hypocrisy, or as one translation has it, of self-justification. 
I had the urge, uh, by the way, recently to take that scriptural text and paste it over the door of the faculty senate chamber. Well, my, my colleague Tom Hibbs dissuaded me. <laughs> not, not because he didn't see the aptitude, of course. You know. <laughs> but you can see that in a way there are things here which sort of provide a kind of trajectory of insight into the contestative character of our own relationship to truth, to wisdom, both in community and in respect of ourselves and our own personal agendas. One cannot avoid recognizing that these things that we are speaking of are requisite virtues for the community in which such wisdom is to be nurtured. But the practicum in wisdom by which understanding is to be raised to the level of experience is an active working out of the meaning of faith by embodied obedience to its precepts in the world. For those of us who have heard the call to become disciples, if I can put it that way, this, this embodiment begins by participation in the community of interpretation we call the church, that wisdom which is Christ. By allowing for persistence in our conversation of the original teaching of our exemplar, education in an authentically Christian context will be, of course, a perpetually self-correcting, lifelong intellectual navigation for ourselves as well as for our students. And thus, as Augustine puts it, though wisdom himself was our home, he made himself the way by which we should reach our home. Now let me turn from Augustine and on Christian doctrine from which most of that came uh, to freedom and community and be more succinct. Moral education in a, a Christian context seems to me thus intrinsically, even inescapably, a corporate function. Whereas great knowledge may be acquired by solitary study, an individualized tutorial mentoring may further sharpen both wit and skill development. An education for wisdom requires for its proper Christian practicum a wider communal context. The Latin word that we use, that you use, collegium, from which we get the English word college, is entirely appropriate uh, to our situated reflection in several ways. Originally, the word in Latin signified a partnership or a body of associates which might engage in a common enterprise. Uh, this could be a guild, it could be a fellowship, or any kind of civic association at all. But in the time of the early church, it came especially to apply to Christian religious foundations, and that's how it gets into the language of the Middle Ages about universities. Uh, it first appears in English not as collegium, of course, but as collage. <laughs> and it appears um, in that uh, difficult um, 14th century scholastic philosopher John Wycliffe. And he speaks of Christ and his college, the apostles. <laughs> it's, a, it's a much older idea of an original apostolic, of course, uh, college, composed of Jesus and his disciples, which gives rise also to the name of the College of Cardinals. And we're familiar with that and thinking about it and praying about it a lot these days. But the firm connection with Christ's teaching as foundation is definitive for the common use of college to signify in the earliest days of university history a society of scholars incorporated within or without a university. And such a college was dedicated especially to Christ-centered learning, not in the sense that it was always formally theological, but in the sense that it sought the radical exemplar of wisdom within whatever sphere of knowledge that was to be studied. The College of the Sorbonne, or the ancient University of Paris, the ancient colleges of Oxford and Cambridge began in precisely this way and with precisely this language. Their many descendants typically also began, in John Henry Cardinal Newman's words, as a response to the desire of the churches that their people should be taught a wisdom, and I'm quoting Newman now, a wisdom safe from the excesses and vagaries of individuals. If we were writing it today, we might have said individualism. You see embodied in institutions which have stood the trial and received the sanction of the ages. Newman's sentence uh, may strike us oddly now in respect of the antimony we sometimes feel between the words freedom and community. Here in the United States, a large number of denominational colleges from across the Christian spectrum have been founded on similar principles by founders who never thought of it being attention at all. Uh, and though many of these have sadly lost, these colleges have lost their original identity and been absorbed into a kind of secular public university milieu. 
Their names and their mottos sometimes still bear a kind of muted testimony to a once lively commitment to apostolic obedience and to evangelical witness. And others, let us be grateful for it, have not entirely forgotten their apostolic roots. The purposes of such colleges and universities is not primarily to critique secular university education, nor is it to try to somehow prove the inadequacies of that education, nor is it simply to provide an indistinguishable version of what they offer. Equally, we do not intend to compete with the more pastoral work of Bible schools or convent schools or seminaries, in any of which some sort of mandatum may in any case prescribe a more strictly theological formation and its formal curricular expression. Rather, what institutions like this one I take it and my own want to offer is a type of rich and foundational education, which from the earliest days of the university has characterized Christian learning, higher learning more broadly. And yet to do so in such a way as to fit our graduates to be singularly productive in the life of the church and in their work in the world now. Our desire is for fit training for the mind and the heart, a rigorous and profitable diet for maturing young Christians, folks who will need to act as well as think, and who will need to think before they act. We must therefore be willing to run counter to the drift in higher education, which has allowed it, I think, in the words of Ernest Boyer, to be seen as a private benefit rather than as a public good. If Christian universities do not constitute a view of learning and the educational experience, which emphasizes the public good, uh, I think they will have, as the uh, students in Texas like to say, blown it. <laughs> Maybe here too, I don't know. So to that end, our curricula ought, in the view of many of us, to be weighted toward the more generous liberality of foundational disciplines. They ought to be historically and pedagogically integrated and grounded, however modestly, in the common apostolic faith that gave rise to those first universities. Further, some of us think that we should endeavor to teach these disciplines by intensive shared reading and direct intellectual engagement in seminar and discussion, not by mass lectures or lectures on videotapes, such as invite the student to be a passive consumer of educational products. Our librarians, chaplains, visiting faculty, and artists in residence all should be invited to take up their part in keeping the spiritual priorities of our learning together before us by their active engagement in community conversation. Many of us believe that we must resist the commodification of education by refusing to treat our students as clients, welcoming, welcoming them rather as neighbors and collaborators, members with us in what Christians of an earlier age were pleased to call an encuclius paideia, a circle or community of learning, of which professors are an integral and, as I said, self-correcting part of the student body. And in the, in the sense that the professors are always continuing to learn. And as much as is possible, we should be reading together from the works of the great thinkers of the ages, considering their scientific discoveries as well as our own, learning to understand the complex beauty of their paintings as well as our own, singing their music of praise to God as well as our own. I sometimes think that, uh, you know, we're, we're blind to the riches. Uh, and in the big box church experience where I live, the Church of the Blinding Light, the Church of the Blessed Overhead Projector, as I sometimes call it. We've lost all that magnificent hymnology. And uh, there's a, one of my colleagues uh, tell me that there's a bit of threat of that in other traditions. The point here is, is that we need to do these things until they become the end our own. We need to take to heart, as we say. We need to take to heart these great gifts of our tradition until they become fit furniture for lively minds. If in practice the intellectual and spiritual fair has not always been so rich as what we would wish to attend, that too can be at least a passing subject for our thoughtful reflection. Perhaps we can with sympathy and as a warning to ourselves try to imagine why it is that universities and colleges like our own, founded on such noble principles, depart from them so far as to become sometimes quite thoroughly opposed, not only to Christ and the Church, 
but in some cases opposed even to cultural remembrance of their own historic witness to Christ. And at last, to the very idea of communal learning, as they search for other things rather than universal and self-transcending truths. I would suggest that far too much of the actual history and worthy practice of our predecessors has been turned aside from the hearts of our colleagues and students alike. And not all of this forgetting or turning aside can be laid to the charge of our, our nominal enemies in, in higher education. Some of it's just us. <laughs> One must have a, a certain sympathy for the desire of late 20th century educators to be free from burdens of the past. But for such a preoccupation with freedom from our connectedness both to predecessors and to others, one always pays a certain price. Freedom has become for our culture a debased term. And in its debased assertion of contradiction, in many cases, of community. Contemporary notions of Christian freedom, as I think we all realize, can too easily reflect the modern secular connotation of autonomy and license rather than the biblical idea which is their contrary, not their source. As late as the Counter-Reformation, the word freedom signified something much more like liberty of spirit rather than independence from others. You ask your students today what they think freedom means, they'll say independence or being autonomous, auto nomos, a law unto myself. In bilingual dictionaries of the earlier periods, um, it's very interesting to look at it in, in English, it's quite plain. English freedom was almost always glossed as French largesse. <laughs> Generosity. And that is, while in contemporary secular parlance, freedom typically implies a kind of self-directedness or self-centeredness with little, if any, sense of corporate responsibility. The earlier understanding typically implies other directedness, a certain generosity and self-effacement. It's preserved, by the way, vestigially in English. Uh, we, we talk about a person who's a free spirit. Uh, that's the guy who buys everybody else in the pub around. <laughs> but this older sense, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, offers a much better translation of the biblical concept. Let me test it on you. Even where liberation from bondage is intended in the scripture, the context is always one of relationship to, to God and to others. When Jesus famously, famously said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free in John 8, you may rest assured that he did not mean the truth would make you independent or autonomous. <laughs> uh, by the way, Protestants are, are, are fond of interpreting it that way. <laughs> <laughs> What he says, as you remember, is, if you continue in my word, then you really are my disciples. And you shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. There's a sequence here. That is, the intellectual and theological basis for our freedom, the social and political aspects arise from it. When the Apostle James uh, spoke likewise of the perfect law of liberty, it was as a condition ideally suited to visiting orphans and widows in their trouble and to keeping oneself pure and unspotted from the world. It's a bunch of about being on your own on Saturday night. <laughs> the double principle has its applications in our little world of academia. It also has its misapplications. One example will have to here suffice for many. The AAUP defends the principle of academic freedom, both in teaching and research, by arguing for its indispensability to the discovery of truth. Freedom, on this view, is an instrumental good. Truth is the greater good it serves. But when our exercise of academic freedom becomes the end in itself, or when its practice becomes a justification for irrationality or anarchic licentiousness, then neither truth nor wisdom are likely to be an outcome of our efforts. From the point of view of the biblical writers and of those who still choose to give them a little bit of attention, other directed freedom is an indispensable condition of a virtuous education, and it's its proper outcome. We, we should acknowledge that non-Christian writers of antiquity have also contributed powerfully to this understanding. Seneca, for example, like Aristotle before him, located this kind of generous freedom in the meaning of liberal studies itself. Even as he insisted that there is really one liberal study alone that deserves the name, 
because it makes a person free, I'm quoting Aristotle, and that is the pursuit of wisdom. You know, it's what makes you free, is the pursuit of wisdom. Yet, for freedom to be generous, we must be taught its potential for self-transcending moral cadences. That, too, is a property of wisdom. Augustine, who so magnificently championed the pursuit of knowledge for the sake of Christ's kingdom, warned that because our minds, our human minds, are liable to fall into mistakes, this very pursuit of knowledge can be a snare to us unless we have a divine teacher, he puts it this way, who we may obey without misgiving, and who may at the same time give us such help as to preserve our own freedom. Freedom itself, Augustine thought, depends upon the perdurability of real authority, as well as of the thinkability of truth. Uh, on this view, one of the most productive things we can do to keep from being conformed to the bondage of this world, to, to preserve a generous liberality, is to resist any merely licentious notion of freedom. If from that selfish individualism we are to be, as the Apostle urges, transformed by the renewing of our minds, it will be precisely so that we discern what is the will of God, what is acceptable, good, and perfect, as it says in Romans 12. For those of us who call ourselves Christian, a key measure of our acquisition of Christian wisdom will be that we ourselves come to understand how to freely obey our sovereign Lord and accordingly to be self-effacing amongst our colleagues as we practice this freedom together. To the degree that our total practice is authentically Christian, we can perhaps even bear a certain useful witness to those who aren't and don't ever intend to be. Mm -hmm. And for whom the idea of community may signify little more than a denominated special interest group. Truth. It's important for the sake of truthfulness and thus for health in our own perspective, that we see that the impulses which oppose witness to Christ in our culture are not at all a peculiar feature of either modern or postmodern society. More, more than a century and a half before Jesus was born, the Roman slave playwright Terence alluded to the anarchic subjectivist character of human nature when he wrote, uh, more succinctly, by the way, than I can imagine translation, he says, quote, omnis tot sententiae. There are as many notions of wisdom as there are people with opinions. <laughs> or as the book of Proverbs has it centuries earlier. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. True, the biblical wisdom writer adds, as the cynical Terence does not a, a very stiff corollary. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes. But the Lord pondereth the hearts. <laughs> That is, for the biblical writer, there's a perspective of extra-personal truth which judges mere opinion and even searches beneath it right down to the motives. That's what Hebrews 4, 12 is saying about what happens to us when we read the scripture, right? The word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing asunder the thoughts and the intentions <laughs> of the heart. We think we're interpreting the word, but the word is actually interpreting us. On the biblical view, we are thus self-deceived when we pretend to be rel relativists. <laughs> it's a game we're playing. It can only go so far. Uh, the Roman poets, of course, have much to contribute on this subject, and I'm often uh, entranced by the way in which they go about it. Uh, Terence knew how much even the suggestion of possibly mind-independent truth could infuriate those whose central motive, even in what they called the pursuit of knowledge, was really just self-justification. And speaking of those whose motive in the pursuit of knowledge was self-justification, Terence writes, Veritas odium parat. Truth engenders hatred. It's a reflex of self-interest to deny that there might be a universal factum which might oblige us to the interests of other people. And our denials can get to be quite vehement when we confront a wisdom which suggests that we cannot be in Kant's or Nietzsche's or anyone else's sense our own creators. Yet I think we should confess that all of this is rather sub-intellectual as activity. Few cultures have outdone ours in glorification of the self-made man or woman. Our pursuit of self-interest at the expense of all other interests we have become habituated to this, and those of us in the Christian community have, to, have absorbed it, I think, also with our mother's milk. 
But, but we, we claim to set out on a different foundation. We, we, we therefore ought to regard what we are doing with utmost care. And I don't mean to suggest that we ought to look upon the wobbly edifice of some of our contemporaries in judgment. We ought to think about those things in compassion. And with much self-scrutiny, lest we also should be tempted by whatever gradualism to forget the most basic lessons of our own educational history, we ought to think back. It is hardly less urgent for us, if I may apply here a remark of the late pontiff, it's hardly less urgent for us that philosophy be recovered at the point where the understanding of faith is linked to the moral life of believers. That's Fides et Ratio again. At the risk of appearing to speak indelicately, I mean, what's a Baptist do quoting the Pope? <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me offer an hypothesis for those of us who share this common task of trying to discover what it is we mean by a Christian education. I want to suggest that we all need a recurrent, intimate contact with a truth which is bigger than ourselves. Intimate knowing, of course, is always going to be a function of incarnational enactment. As the Gospels, the Johannine General Epistles, St. Augustine, and Ignatius are at pains to teach us, in order to know this truth at all, we have to do this truth. The knowing and the doing are inseparable from each other. Uh, Shakespeare has a wonderful play, a comic play called As You Like It, which I hope you've all seen and remember a little bit. And there's a witty character, do you remember, remember named Touchstone, mm -hmm. uh, who echoes both Socrates and St. Paul when he says, The fool doth think he's wise, but the wise man knows himself to be a fool. <laughs> well, friends, I think uh, we should let Touchstone be our Touchstone too. Because in his own way, he points us to the rock. After a lot of um, years of thinking about these things and, and struggling and doing badly sometimes with them, uh, I've come to think that Augustine was surely right about another of his incarnational analogies, namely that for Christian education to be efficacious at all. And I'm quoting Augustine from our Christian doctrine here, that the teacher himself, and I've added to herself, must be a touchstone, a vital exemplar. Few enough really want that sort of accountability, which is, I suppose, why the apostles thought that few among us should be teachers. <laughs> but, but where a sense of vocation in us is confirmed in some way as authentic, it is yet one more instance in which those virtues which are our goal, indispensably, are also the means by which we attain the goal. Let me gather together these related thoughts. It's my own growing conviction that to do our work accountably in the difficult time in which we live, both in our scholarship and in our teaching, we will need to refurbish the sources of ancient as well as modern wisdom. The wisdom of others, as well as that sort of wisdom which makes us seem wise in our own eyes. We're real good at that. And not good enough in the other. As a people who are trying to take Christian revelation and tradition seriously, I think that we must learn to love with heart, soul, and mind both God and our neighbor, whether the sopius of the past or the sopius of other cultures. And that no learning that neglects either of these can be meaningfully Christian. Many of us have found it easier to love the neighbor than to love God with heart, soul, and mind. These loves to get them together will require the twin disciplines, I think, of a trained memory and linguistic self-transcendence, and, and by these means a significant widening of the circle of those we are pleased to call neighbor. Students who learn alongside of us, not merely in front of us, will, in apprenticing to these disciplines of the faithful heart, experience thus something much more of the true meaning of their Christian freedom, and they'll grow deeper in wisdom and in truth and in love. Moreover, if we however stumblingly, set out to do our part wisely. What our students will have learned, they will be able to pass on, because they will have come to know it by heart. But if acquisition of wisdom, a deeper knowledge of freedom, community, and love of truth are to be part of our educational mission, not just 
in the mission statement somewhere, but in the actual work we're doing. In deep and principled practice. These things must also, if I may paraphrase Augustine once more, become the means by which we fulfill the mission. We who are teachers must be those who freely obey in a fully thoughtful, yet vigorously practical way, the great commandment. Morally, spiritually, intellectually, that's to say, with heart and soul and mind, we are the ones we must be willing to serve up our faith a little more generously than sometimes we have. That is, we ought to serve it up in all these dimensions. We must be able to offer to the hungry in our midst 